That third verse says, He took my sins and my sorrows. Would you join me on that third verse? He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them His very own. He bore my burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Sing that chorus now. Great singing. Thank you. you. May be seated. Our ushers are coming for the offering this morning. I mentioned just a couple of things. Um, uh, tomorrow, parent teacher conference, and uh, so hope you'll schedule all that if you're part of our school. And then Tuesday, January 17th at 12 noon, our senior summings luncheon uh, in the fellowship hall. If you can bring a salad, vegetable, or dessert, uh, they'll provide the entree. You can sign up in the information desk right out in the main lobby today. So don't forget to do that by tonight. This Wednesday night's our quarterly family growth night. And uh, we want to invite you to be a part of all that. Uh, this uh, Wednesday night, uh, Pastor and Mrs. Dave Nofsinger uh, from up, up in Oak Grove, Kentucky, will be our guest speakers for the evening. And we'll come in here also, Pensacola Christian College will be singing. And they'll get us started with a song. We'll take up the offering because you've got to take the offering up. And then we'll split up, and the ladies will stay here. And Brother Dave uh, will take the men over in the fellowship hall. And Miss Jane will be speaking in here, the ladies. And so don't miss it. They're wonderful speakers. They have an exciting ministry there in Oak Grove, and I've been up there many times. I hope you'll be here for that. And then next Sunday, we will recognize our church will, Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, next Sunday, and Sunday evening, the Lord's Supper. I hope you'll be a part of the first Lord's Supper here at your church next Sunday night. It is re-enrollment time for Franklin Road Christian School, and I hope that you'll uh, do just that. January is for church families, and so if you're part of our ministry, our ministry runs the school, and so you get first shot. You can register all the way up to August, uh, but this is when exclusively for our church family. So if you're if you know you're going to go get your packet, make sure you got it, get signed up. If you're thinking about it, go get your packet, get signed up, uh, and and make the decision, the final decision. We get you closer to August because if you wait till then, you may not have a spot for your child because next month school families, and then we open it up uh, to the community March the first. And I'll tell you, we're giving record number of uh, tours of the school, and so. Please get involved. We need our church's involvement. You all get a tuition break for this, and so uh, we want you to be a part of it. We think God is just doing a fabulous job in our school. We're getting a lot of families in our church, too, from the school, and so you be praying about all of that. We're thankful for that. And uh, praying for us this morning is uh, Pastor Ron Hayes, and, of course, this is Matt Hayes' father, and he uh, came down for our a banquet, our a bus banquet. We had a full room over there. Thank you all of our bus workers for being part of that. We had a fantastic night. He had a great job preaching for us. And uh, he is assistant to Paul Kingsbury up at North Love Baptist Church in Rockford, Illinois. Before he comes to pray, I was looking around. I saw Kenton's parents here. Good to see you all. And uh, just appreciate you all keeping him in line. And uh, then uh, also, uh, it's good to have uh, Ernie and Martha Brockman. Your preacher told on me. I knew you were coming. We're good to see them. He worked this, he and his wife worked the servicemen center there right outside the 101st First Airborne Division, the gates there, for many, many years. I think he does chaplaincy now and with the fire department, different things. Good to see you all. These are just good people. By the way, my wife and I enjoyed your cooking, too. We came over and ate that one day. Never forget that. And then I'm also told that uh, Pastor Aaron King and his wife Amanda, their family's here. Where are you at, Brother King? Right there he is. God bless you. Welcome to our church. And the pastor's down in Georgia, and so good to have him. There are other guests here, the Youngs, Richard Young family. I think they had another wedding in their family. And uh, I think some of the Youngs are here with uh, Brother and Mrs. Young. God bless you all. Good to have you all. But Hayes, come and pray for us. Good to have you in our church. Let's give him a good Franklin welcome, Brother Ron Hayes. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful that we have the opportunity to serve you. You've given us strength. You've given us grace. And, Lord, I just thank you for this church. I thank you for what it means to, to me and to my wife and to my family, Lord. And, and uh, we thank you for Pastor Norris and his wife and the, the friendship that we've been able to develop. And, Lord, I just pray that you would just please continue to meet this, the needs of, of Franklin Road Baptist Church. The lighthouse it is in the community here, Lord, is is just fabulous and I pray Lord not only just here but around the world 
So Lord, I pray that you would just uh, be with uh, Brother Norris as he will come and, and share the, the word of God with us. I pray, Holy Spirit of God, as he speaks outwardly, that you'd speak inwardly to our hearts and accomplish all that you want in our lives. And Lord, the theme of the church is to rise up. Lord, I pray as Christians, we'll all rise up and surrender and follow you. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As the darkness closes in on this world full of sin, Look around you, not many are left standing. The word of God's been compromised, holy living criticized, and iniquity on every hand's abounding. But if you have a place to go, where the old story is told, strength that we need for this hour so much the more as you see the day approaching so much the more when his coming is at hand you need the church and the saints and the worship of Word of God. And this world can't understand why I build my life around it. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. So much the more as you see the day approaching. So much the more when his coming is at hand. You need the church and the saints and the worship of the Lord to stand faithful to the end. Oh, be faithful. and faithful to the end so much the more thank you Hebrews 10 25 forsake not the assembly of ourselves together as a man of some is but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And um, that just, that's a command for us to be faithful, and I appreciate that good song. And to take your Bibles this morning, turn to Genesis chapter 1. We'll just read some select passages in Scripture in just a moment, and then we'll take our text in uh, Genesis chapter 1. And if you're reading through your Bible, uh, you have already read through what I'm going to preach on tonight. 
And as you leave uh, today, don't forget we have the Bible reading schedules and also the calendars. These are free, and so pick them up, and uh, we want to get rid of all of those. And then today, available out in the lobby area around the coffee shop is um, the uh, sermon notebook. And uh, you can pick these up. I think they're $5. We have more than that in there. And that's just a little section that you can um, write down sermon notes, I believe. If you hear it and you see it and you write it, you'll be more likely to remember it. And uh, so uh, I want to encourage you to pick those up. And we're working on a prayer journal, and we'll get that to you sometime real soon. I want to say this about <clears throat> Pastor Hayes. I appreciate so much uh, his faithfulness there and his ministry where he's at, working alongside of Dr. Paul Kingsbury. Dr. Kingsbury, of course, is the church that has the Reformers Unanimous, and many of you have had a chance to benefit from that ministry there. But it is not just a national ministry. It is an international ministry. In fact, they're pouring a lot of time right now in the Philippines down there because of the, uh, the drug addiction was so rampant, and then the, the, uh, the president down there just decided he was just going to start killing people there involved in it. And so they were begging out, uh, begging for somebody to come. They went to the Catholic Church there and said, how can you help us with our addiction? addiction program and so forth, and they said, we don't have anything to help you. And so uh, they got a hold of Reformers Unanimous, and so they're just going great guns in the Philippines. I said, let's say this, <clears throat> that a lot of times the preacher is not, not there, and because they have a national ministry as well, international ministry as well as their local ministry, but uh, Brother, Brother uh, Hayes and some of the other men, the outler and some of the other men up there just stand in the gap, make up the edge, and they, uh, they help bolster their pastor, support their pastor. And that means so much uh, to the man of God. I want to say that for you because nobody else is going to say it. I'm going to say it and thank God for men like you. Let's stand together, please, and we'll begin reading from uh, <clears throat> Genesis. And some of these I'm just going to read to kind of get you into the mindset of what God is doing here in the very first book of the Bible. And if you'll just keep your Bibles open, we're going to zip through some select passages here. And then I'll come back and we'll read a text together. Look at chapter 1. Verse number one, again, we're taking our, our theme last week, let God arise from Psalm 68, verse one, but uh, I'm going to preach on that this morning, and then I should say this tonight just by way of uh, advertising, I want you to come back to church tonight. Uh, Sunday night service is completely different than Sunday morning. I know that the norm today in a lot of churches is you have four services a weekend and all the services are alike. It's never been like that here. Uh, we have Sunday school, which is different. We have we have Sunday morning preaching, the worship hour, and then we have Sunday night, which is a completely different service. I preach to Christians there, and tonight I will start a series entitled Going with God, and it's about the wanderings of the people of Israel in the book of Numbers, so we'll do, the, do kind of an overview study, not the entire book, but the book of Numbers, and that will start tonight. I don't want you to miss one part of it. This part uh, tonight is very, very important for us to get down because this will help us in our Christian life. But today I want to talk about just this idea of, of, of God arising in, in creation. Look at uh, verse number 1, chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And then from the next several verses, he has six days of creation. He rests on the seventh day, in chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> but we begin to see God rising up in creation. Look at uh, chapter 1, verse number 16. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. Every morning, you and I get to see the sun rise. Every night, the stars come out. In fact, just this past week, a full moon. And uh, I snuck me a little kiss under the full moon. <clears throat> My wife, that is. <clears throat> Had Braxton or Baylor been there, I'd have got a little kiss from them too. But anyway, uh, beautiful, beautiful full moon this week. Look down at verse 26, chapter 1, verse 26. God said, let us, that's the plural uh, form of God, Elohim, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and 
God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every thing that moveth upon the earth. God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which, which, by the way, I've got three packets of herbs right here in my pocket, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree uh, in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for me, and to every beast of the field, and lo, every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. And of course, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2, he rested. Look at chapter 2, a couple more verses. Chapter 2, verse 7. Chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord said, and Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, literally he did this, the breath of life. Man became a living what? A living soul. Skip over now and uh, look at chapter 3, verse 8. Chapter 3, verse 8. This was immediately following the sin, the original sin, but nevertheless there is a habit that had been formed prior to sin. Verse number 8, chapter 3, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Skip back, please, and look at our text verse, verse number 26, chapter 1, verse 26. I'd like for you to read that with me together. Chapter 1, verse 26. Let's read that in unison together. Ready? And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. I'm going to speak on this subject in relation to our theme this year, the God that arises in creation. Let's pray together. Father, bless now, please the reading of your word. We believe the Bible is inerrant. It's infallible. It's God-breathed. It's inspired. We pray today that you'll help us to understand its truths. Make it come alive in our life today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I was preaching in an educator's conference this past week in Pigeon Forge, and my wife had a chance to go up with me there. And, and uh, it was the first time that we had been back up in that area since the forest fires, massive forest fires there. We had just a little break in between some of the workshops, and uh, we had a chance to drive up into Gatlinburg and see the devastation there. It was, it was enormous. Uh, we uh, drove up to the Park Vista and saw all the cabins there around that particular mountain were, were burned, oh, nothing left but the... the uh, foundation. When I say it burned everything, I mean there was nothing left. Maybe a metal hot water tank or something metal that was laying among the, the rubble there. We were able to see right where the uh, charred forest floor would come right down to the road and jump the road and keep on going up the other side of the mountain. We drove through Gatlinburg and we were shocked at just how close it got to the city. In fact, if you're familiar with Gatlinburg, you, you drive through the city and downtown Gatlinburg, if you make that loop and come back down around where the uh, river runs along, the uh, Pigeon River runs along the base of that mountain where the aquarium is and so forth, there were a couple of hotels there that the, had come down that mountain and burned them. There's nothing left but the foundation right there, right in. That's how close it got. We stood on top of the mountain there at the Park Vista. We were amazed at just how much you could see because everything had just been so burned. And we drove up into an area where my wife and I had stayed many, many times in the cabin there that we stayed in was nothing but rubble. And in fact, it was, uh, there, were, there were no cabins left. Every now and then you would see 10 cabins destroyed and maybe one standing there like, how did that happen? And, and we looked at all that and the, the, the amazing thing to me was this, that the trees, the top of the trees, every, every now and then maybe you see some pine trees where the needles were charred brown, but the top of tree, the trees and the trees themselves were still all intact. And here's what they told me. They said that fire moves so fast. If you remember how dry it was back in July and August and September, and we had had rain sometimes, or nearly 60, 70 days we had had no rain. And then all those leaves began to fall uh, there in the forest, and that was ahead of us here. And it just made a tinderbox. I mean, just almost like gas and oil was on the floor of those forest beds. 
what really burned was pretty much those leaves in that underbrush. So you got, you got soft laying leaves there. One man told me that there were cer certain times that they clocked that fire in some of the areas that create a wind tunnel, they clocked that fire going 87 miles an hour in some areas. That's how fast that moved across that floor. And so because of that, it didn't necessarily get those trees. I said all that to say this. Here is a wonderful truth. God will bring all that back. He'll bring his part back. And God has so designed nature so that the trees, they'll bud again. And the, uh, before long, we'll have the beautiful smoky mountains. And I understand that doesn't take away the devastation of the lives there and the, and the buildings there, some 2,500 buildings gone. Man will have to bring his back part back by the sweat of his face. But God will bring his part back effortlessly because that's just the way he made things. And understand that God is always working in nature. Right now, the roots of those big old trees are socked down in that soil, and they're getting the water they need. Now, I don't know exactly how it's all going to work out. That's not my problem. That's God's, and God's just going to bring that back because God is always working. In the book of Genesis, we have the record of God who never had a beginning, never had, has an end, but he, he begins to rise, and and he make his presence known in the universe for the very first time. And he does that by creating this planet and all that's in it. We don't take the time to read it, but day one, God rises, and the first thing he does is he creates light and divides the darkness. Day two, the, we have the formation of the Earth's atmosphere and separating the water into parts, and we have the oceanic and the subterranean water and the atmospheric water, and understand that up to the time of Noah, it never rained on Earth, so the, the God had a way to uh, put a canopy over the earth and it sustained itself <clears throat> in a miraculous way. Day three, we have the <clears throat> dry land in the oceans and the system uh, to water the entire land surface using those subterranean waters involving probably springs or mist or maybe both. And the vegetation begins to be created and, and seed bearing plants and trees that, that bear fruit. <clears throat> and God created everything with its seed in it and he created everything with an appearance of age. No tree had to start from infancy. Although he put the progression in there of all of that <clears throat> because God is always working. And most likely, uh, this was when the beautiful Garden of Eden was formed. Day four, the sun and the moon becomes created and, and the complete uh, establishment of, of their orbits and the orbit of the earth so as to mark the passage of time, the months, the seasons, and years. Stars and other planets were created on this day. Day five, but the water creatures of all kinds and all that uh, had the breath of life that were in them. And back in, in, during that time before we had death come on the earth, uh, pretty much it, most believe that all were vegetarians. The birds were created, the fowls of the air, again, vegetarian. Later, uh, some of that changed after sin. A lot of things changed after sin. Day six, the <clears throat> land animals, again, at that point, all vegetarian creatures that move close to the ground, the small animals, the large animals, and animals that man would use to sustain himself with livestock. And then, of course, on day six, God's trophy, the first man, Adam, and the first woman, Eve, formed from the dust of the ground. And, of course, day seven, God rested. You say, well, why did you sell this preacher? And <clears throat> why does God give us all this detail at the beginning of his word? And why is it in such descriptive order. In other words, we couldn't have life till we had oxygen. We couldn't have plant life till we had soil and water. And God is <clears throat> very organized in all he does. You say, why do we have all this? I'm going to tell you why. I want you to listen carefully. Because every day, even today, 6,000 years later, every day the sun comes up is a reminder that God is rising amongst us. Every night that you see the moon and the stars, it's a reminder that God is with us. And every time you see a rainbow. It's a reminder that God rose up one day for man. And in just a few days, the grass will begin to turn green. Yesterday was kind of like a spring day, wasn't it? <clears throat> the trees will shoot forth their buds, and the flowers will peak their beautiful heads above the ground. And all of this is a reminder it's to God's human creation. The day in and <clears throat> day out, God is rising up in our beautiful nature, and you and I are supposed to take note of that. 
we don't worship creation. We worship the God of creation. And understand that God is always working. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, God specifically says this, that while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Smoke that in your global warming pipe, Al Gore. <clears throat> now comes the question. <clears throat> Why did God make such a big splash in the universe and create all of this? Why would the Godhead, who is in perfect harmony, schedule an interruption to that perfect harmony and fellowship to be bothered with creating topsoil and then making a creature from that very topsoil? Why would the triune God not choose to remain within the confines of the massive third heaven that we've not visited yet? And why would he go to such extreme to make his work so visible 24-7? By the way, if you're locked in your little dark world and you don't enjoy a beautiful sunrise or a sunset or the full moon like we had the other night, if you don't enjoy the stars on a clear night, if you don't enjoy the, the ryegrass starting to come up and the old dead whatever that is growing that don't grow except two months a year in our yards, if you don't enjoy the beautiful flowers, then why in the world did God make them? And what is wrong with you? Because God paints a wonderful picture every day of our lives. Why would God go to such extremes extreme to make his work so visible 24-7? Are you ready for the answer? Here it is. God did all of it for us. Mankind was made the, the trophy of God's creation. The Bible declares that you and I are the apple of God's eye. And uh, I'm thankful for that. As we talk about letting God rise up in our life, I want to take you all the way back to the beginning where God just worked overtime just to get our attention, and he continues to do that through creation and other things, just to let us know how good that he is to us so that we'll have a desire to let him work in our lives. I want to give you several of these. First of all, I want you to notice, please, that the God that arises fashions you as a person. This is all a creation. But the God that arises fashions you, fashions me, as an individual person. Look at verse number 26. And God said, let us make man in our image and in our, after our likeness, and let them have dominion of the fish of the sea, fowl of the air, the cattle of the earth, every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Look at verse number 27. So, that's what they agreed to do. So, God created man in his own image, in the image of God, Created he him, male and female, created he them. So they make this decision to do this, and God does it, but notice how he does it. He stresses the fact three times, I am going to make man in my image. Now understand this about God from the very get-go. God is not some unapproachable deity that has no relationship with man. God has perfect personality. God made us this way. God made us in his image after the likeness of the Godhead. And so when you get to heaven you're not, uh, and, and you see God for the first time, <clears throat> it's not going to shock you that he's made in the image of man, vice versa, I should say. So he's not some, some grotesque-looking cyclops feature that's, that's on, on the toy aisle uh, over Toys R Us. Why you want to scare your kids with stuff like that, I don't know. But he's a God that looks like you and I, though he's perfect. Is everybody with me right now? And understand that God, the God that arises and wants to rise up in your life, he fashioned you as a person. God himself breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. He gave us eyes like his. The Bible says God has eyes. They run to and fro up in the air. God gave us eyes like his. God has ears. He hears our prayers. So he gave us ears like his. And for the same purpose, God has lips. And, and from the lips of God and the mouth of God, Understand, he speaks to us. And so God had all those things. So he, he gave us all those things. And, and the, the day that God reached down, Adam, after he <laughs> formed them <laughs> from the dust of the ground, he literally reached down and he, his lips touched his lips and he breathed into him the breath of life for the first time. And understand that the, the day that you come out in this world from your mother's womb and you breathe that air for the first time, that air came from God. God created oxygen, and God created air, and God created you and I. Who are we not to let God rise up in our life? 
He gave us intellect, and Adam did not need to learn how to talk. Our grandson right now is learning all kinds of new words, and everything you say, he says, because that's practice. He's trying to learn how to talk. Adam didn't have to learn how to talk. God gave him that intellect immediately. He didn't learn how to, how, learn how to walk. God gave him that ability. He was created as, as man, not an infant. Sometimes we forget about that. He gave a man a living soul in order to desire God. And he gave a, a man personality and have the ability to love and to laugh and to cry and to learn. And he gave us the ability to communicate so we can make relationships. And that first relationship that Adam had was with God. Can I just say, I, I don't, it doesn't matter if you're saved, unsaved, backslidden, living the foot of the cross, rich, poor, it doesn't matter if you're from America or from uh, uh, another, another nation, it doesn't matter. God, it is as natural as walking for you and I to have a relationship with God. But yet you and I make it difficult because we want to go our own way and we don't want to listen to God, we don't read the Bible, we don't want anybody to tell us anything to do. So uh, we fail to have that relationship with God. But it's natural. The first relationship that man had was with God. So God arises and fashions you as a person. Write this second thing down. The God that arises feeds you with his provision. I like this. It. my favorite, favorite point right here. Because I like eating. How many of y'all like eating? Amen. Verses 28 uh, through 30, we see that he says, I'm going to, I want them to be fruitful and multiply. I'm going to give them dominion of the fish of the sea. You, you fishermen, you're allowed to catch fish and eat them. You hunters, you're allowed to shoot those animals and eat them. For those of you who don't believe that and you're opposed to guns, then get on their back and ride that deer down and stab him. I don't know, but we're allowed to do that. <laughs> guns don't kill people. People kill people. Sin. I don't know, that wasn't in my notes right there. I promise you, it really wasn't in my notes. It... God says in verse 29, says, I'm going to give you every herb-bearing seed, which is on the face of the earth, every tree, yielding seed, and it will be for meat, that means for food, verse 29. Beasts of the field and all that, green herb. He says it's going to be very good. I say, amen. Look at chapter 2, verse 9. Chapter 2, verse 9. And now the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that was, look at this, pleasant, to the sight, and good for food. Oh, I like that real good right there. How many like food? Amen? God provides us with everything that we need to survive. You say, uh, did God make Reese cups? You know what? If you really think all this stuff through, yeah. He made the peanut. He showed man how to smash it. He, he made the sugar cane, that there's a lot of that in there, and the cocoa bean. Yeah, I'm a preacher. He didn't make the wrapper. He made the tree that made the wrapper. Yeah, but he didn't make the mixers that mixes all that up. So, yeah, he made all that too, and he made the man that did it. He made fried chicken too. And he shows how to take a potato and peel it and mash it and put a lot of butter on it too. I'm getting hungry right now. It is my job to make you hungry so you'll listen fast. I can preach fast. We can get out of here. We serve, the Bible says this stuff is pleasant to the sight and good for food. <laughs> I, 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 can eat, I can eat food. It don't matter if you slop it all in there. It all runs together. But every now and then I like to go to these places where they put everything out there, you know, and they put this little leaf on there, and you decide, do I eat that leaf or not? And they garnish everything, and they call that plating. We here in the South don't care if you plate it. We care how much grease and butter is in it. <laughs> so God, God just, <laughs> some of y'all don't even pray for your food. You say, well, preacher, if you were to eat my wife's cooking, you wouldn't pray for it. I'd, I'd pray for it even more. Oh, God, don't kill me. Oh, God. <laughs> y'all look like you need to laugh. But, but, uh, God tells us early on that he, this is good for us. This is, he, he didn't, we didn't have to eat manna. We don't have to eat seaweed. We don't graze like animals. 
We get our food and we stir it in. Y'all watch those cooking shows. It's amazing. That guy travels around all these places and he goes to all these diners and dumps and all that. He goes in all those places. Do you ever watch them cook? They pour that stuff in there. I mean, they'll pour, pour sometimes 20 ingredients in. It's amazing to me. I want to find out where some of those places are. And how much can you cook a piece of meat? But it's exciting to me. They get that bark on there, and then you pull that away, and you pull out the, oh, my, we're talking food now. I mean, it's pleasant to the eyes. It's good for food. God provides shelter for us. <clears throat> After we sinned, we had to have raiment. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> God gave us clothes, and a little note right here, a little sidebar. <clears throat> After man sinned, he knew he was naked, and so he provided himself leaves. <laughs> and God said, no, no. Whenever God made clothes, he made coats of skin. So go write that down somewhere. Well, I'll, I'll get off that. But I'm just saying the God that wants to rise up in you, he wants to provide for you. Now, I'm going to talk about more of that tonight, not the food part, but how God provides for us. Why does he do all that? He does that because he loves us. But here's my last point, and this is the most important. The God that arises, why does he do all this? The God that arises fellowships with these people. He's going to find someone to fellowship with. So it may as well be you and I. Look at chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. There he had the ability. And then we find out by the time we get to chapter 3, verse 8, that he walks with them. He heard the voice of God walking in the garden, and he was able to communicate with Adam. The Bible teaches us that there was a day when God literally and physically walked and talked with man. How do you believe the Bible teaches that? Amen. Watch this now. God desires fellowship with mankind, the true of his creation. He uh, doesn't say much about uh, his fellowship with angels. He's not interested in fellowship with animals. Uh, he's not uh, interested in fellowship with trees. Maybe I ought to go off on that right there. Uh, uh, he made the chainsaw too, by the way. And, so, uh, uh, but he's interested, he's interested, his desire is a fellowship with mankind. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Understand this, that God wants to fellowship with everybody. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And the main thing about becoming a born-again Christian is God is able to speak to our hearts. God's able to guide us and provide for us and lead us. You know, sadly, we understand that fellowship is only possible with those who believe in him. The sin of Adam and Eve severed that beautiful relationship that man had with God, and we read about it in chapter 3. But the beautiful truth is that God so loved man. If you read on in this book that he made a way for man to reconcile with him, Whenever they had that confrontation in the garden, God came to meet them. You can read on, read on and find out that man hid from God because he'd sinned. He took of that. He had one commandment, and he couldn't obey it. So he broke God's law. This relationship, this fellowship was severed, but God took it on himself, not Adam. He took it on himself for the first time to slay an animal shed that blood and provide that slain animal skin as a covering for them. We believe that's a picture of the cross. And understand this today that it's through the cross of Jesus Christ that you and I can have a relationship with God and fellowship with God. It's always through the blood of Jesus Christ. From Genesis chapter 3 all the way through, it's always been through Jesus. These were just pictures of Jesus. Can I say this? If you're here today and you can say, I, I've never prayed to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior because I, I just never have done that. Can I just tell you, you can have all your sins washed away today if you'll believe in Jesus Christ. John 3, 16, the Lord said to Nicodemus there, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And can I say, it's the only way you're ever going to get to heaven. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. And you can be saved today. You can start that 
relationship with God today by being saved. Understand that the very breath in your lungs and the beat in your heart is a gift from God to you. Today, whether you're saved or lost and unsaved today, your life is an indication that God loves you. Your very existence today is an indication that God wants to rise up in your life. He wants you to, he wants you to live for Him. All the beauty and benefit that God has created in this earth is so that you and I will love Him and fellowship with Him. All the provision is intended to draw us to God. <clears throat> Listen to this verse, Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of His goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. There will be people that live and die, and as they die, they'll say God was not good to them. But nobody has an excuse to coin that verse. But the very, very first man and first woman, God took them, gave them perfect health, and set them in the most beautiful place known to man, the Garden of Eden. Ever since sin, man is trying to get back and re, recapture that Eden moment and atmosphere. We've never been able to do it. Because God still loves us, God doesn't want us to make our home on earth. God wants us to follow Him as He leads us to a better place. A city with no foundations. A place that's a beautiful place called heaven. I hath not seen, neither ear heard, Neither has entered in the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Can I say this? God does all that and everything in between because he loves us. I think about today while some are trying to become one with planet earth and others try to adapt to their environment by becoming compatible with mother earth. And others today are trying to find their inner self through Transcendental meditation and yoga, and they chase after something that is not real. In fact, some of that borders on, borderlines on the spirituality that God forbids us to be involved in. But nevertheless, it's a big thing. Many today even absorb themselves with self, and they literally kick God off the throne of their life, and they'll say, I'm going to do what I don't want to do. And while all that goes on, understand this. Don't miss what I'm getting ready to say. There is a God in heaven who wants to rise up in your life. He wants to bless you if you'll just submit to him and surrender control to him. I'm a believer in that. I think that's what the Bible teaches. Let God control your life. Abraham let God rise up in his life, and he was called the friend of God. If you go back and look at Abraham's life, he had a lot of sin. He had a lot of problems. But he had faith, and, and every time he let God ri rise up in his life, he became known as a friend of God. David let God rise up in his life, and he was a sinner as well, but he was later known as a man after God's own heart. And we come all the way to the Apostle Paul and all the sin that had been in his life. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, he makes this statement, For all of us to read that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I'm just saying, ladies and gentlemen, not only is it possible to have a relationship with God. It is God's desire to have a relationship with you. He wants you to be saved. We who are saved, God wants us to walk with him. I hope you'll stick with me in this series because what I'm trying to get you to do is I'm trying to get you to listen to the still small voice in your life, which is the Spirit of God, and start going his direction. And today... Can I tell you this? No matter what you've got going on, God loves us so much. He has given us his best. And the moment we breathe our last breath, we're going to understand just how good it really is. Let's bow our heads with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. I appreciate your attention this morning. Right now in your life, right now, where is your relationship or walk with God? When was the last time you sincerely praised God for something in your life? When's the last time you had, you had a fervent talk with the Lord in prayer? When was the last time you opened your Bible and you're reading your Bible and God spoke to your heart and you can tell that the Lord's showing me something right there? 
When was the last time you said, Lord, I surrender all? I've given you my life, lock, stock, and barrel. I can tell you the day that I did that. I was saved. And as I was growing up in my mom and dad's house, of course, I followed their lead as they raised us. And then I got out on my own. And I remember when I got married, I remember going to the altar up in West Virginia. And I hit that altar and said, Lord, I've given you everything. This was before I ever was called to preach. Lord, I'm giving you everything. And my wife, I could feel her warm hand right on my shoulder. She knelt beside of me and praying the same prayer. Lord, I give you everything. Paul left us with these words, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Can I tell you this? God is never going to hurt you if you'll just follow his will. Let's stand together, please, with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ your Savior, we'll have somebody stand on the end of each aisle with a Bible in their hand. They'd love to take that Bible, and today you can come to Jesus Christ. We'd love to have you do that. Today, I'm talking to Christians here now. God wants to move in your life. He's always moving. Find out where God's going and get on there with Him. Can I say this? What is it you need to kind of surrender to Him and give up? in order for him to rise up and give him more. Don't let nothing stop you. I want you to say this, preacher, this morning, I, I want God to rise up in my life. Would you pray for me? I want God to rise up in my life. Just put your hand up real high. I want God to move in my life. I want God to move in my family, my marriage, my business. I want God to move. Surrender to him. Give him more. Today, if you're here and you're unsaved, why don't you just leave your seat and come. These men will help you. If you're a man, a man will talk with you. If you're a lady, They'll give you a lady, and the lady will talk with you and pray with you. Let's take this time to draw closer to God. Father, bless now, please, your word. And I understand there are some things that were said here that we can just rejoice in and we can agree with, but the greater, the greater burden is that we say yes to you in every area of our life. Thank you for your beginning and all this. Thank you for what you do. And We'll step out these doors in just a moment. We'll see the beautiful sunshine reminds us that you're rising up, you're moving. Help us to have that desire in our life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God speak in your heart. Just come right on as they sing, would you? Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord, and he will surely give you rest by trusting in his word only trust him only trust him only trust him now he will save you he will save you he will save you now. We taught this in Sunday school that this church is not just the building, it's the people inside this building. In order for a revival to come, it is going to be in direct proportion of how much we let God work in our life. And I'm really counting on you men and women in this ministry right here to let God do just that. And it's going to take some surrender. It's going to take some giving up. It's going to be saying, Lord, not my will, but your will be done in my life. Then God has a, a, an avenue. He has a road in your life. And he'll, he'll do it if he needs to do it just to straighten us out. But he wants you to be willing in that. We'll sing one more verse of the song. Let's let God speak to our hearts. Would you do that? For Jesus shed his precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Let's sing that chorus together. Only trust Him. Sing it. Only trust Him. Only trust Him. Only trust Him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, it's good to have Elizabeth uh, Russman come. And I